right into the message today. Um, Mr. PowerPoint man, you may have to stay with me. I may jump around a little bit because of time. Uh, we're, in, we're in a series that started last Sunday entitled, Let's Go. Let's Go. We find it in Luke chapter number 10. We're going to stay in Luke 14 today. We're going to spend time there. In Luke chapter number 10, after this, the Lord says that he appointed 70 and sent them ahead of him in pairs to every town and the place where he himself was about to go. And he told them, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. There it is right there. Now go. I'm sending you. What Jesus was endeavoring to do, he could not do by himself in the city he was going to. And the 12 that he had following him wasn't enough either. So he raised up 70 more to go with him to set the stage for him to become the forerunners for him going into the place where he was about to unleash revival and miracles and signs and wonders and harvest. It's interesting that Jesus by himself didn't have enough, chose not to have enough is probably the better way to say it. And it's interesting that he recognized that the 12 who had been following him, they were not enough in quantity either to be able to fulfill the, the taking in, the gathering of the abundance of the harvest that was laid out in front of him. So he said, I want all my disciples right now to go. Second favorite word in the Bible is now. Because now means, two of you, now means now. It doesn't mean later. It doesn't mean after you've prayed about it. Jesus said it, and I'm going to be obedient in it immediately. Right now. It's, it's like the way I was raised. When my mother told me to do something, it wasn't negotiable on when I was going to do it. She wanted me to do it right now. Now, as a matter of fact, as a, as a father myself, I have taught my children that delayed obedience is disobedience. Delayed obedience is disobedience. When, when I tell you, I'm a parent, I'm a parent, I'm a parent, parents for a second. I believe one of the great um, uh, disservices we do to the development of our children is when we ask them to do something. When we ask them to do something, will you go get me some, some, something to drink out of the fridge? No, 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 no. I'm daddy. I pay every bill in this house. You don't have a room. You have my room that I allow you to steward. Your closet is not your closet. It's my closet that I let you keep your... It's not even your stuff if you didn't pay for it. I'm letting you keep the stuff I work hard to buy for you. But in the event you get too proverbially big for your britches, I will remind you him <laughs> that this is not your room, this is my room. And I'm just letting you borrow it for a season. And when I let you borrow it and this season is complete, like Milk that has been met its expiration date. It spoils. Don't you come back here and bring more with you. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> because, so when I ask you to do so, I sat down with my children just this week. And I said, I want you to give me a list. Uh-huh. Uh, don't you, don't, aren't you glad you're not the preacher's kid? <laughs> aren't you glad you're not the preacher's kid? I sat down with him this week. And I just, every once in a while, daddies, every once in a while, you just need to go into your house and proverbially pull your pants down to your ankles and show your rear end. Just to remind everybody, there is somebody in charge. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You ought to praise God you're not married or, <laughs> or I'm your daddy. So that was one of those weeks this week. That was one of those weeks. Ask my kids. It's been amazing. 
Ever since I showed my proverbial rear end, rooms are clean, bathrooms are clean, game room is clean, the grass got cut, the car got washed, the dog got groomed. Y'all hear what I'm saying? It's amazing. It's amazing what happens because now means now. And I think one of the disservices we do to our children is we're always asking them to do something. No, no, no. You don't have to be a jerk about it. But I'm not, I'm, I'm not asking you if you're going to go get me something out of the refrigerator. I, I'm saying, please go get me something out of the refrigerator. And when you bring it, thank you. I appreciate you serving me. Because at no point in your existence are you ever going to get outside of serving someone. So we might as well teach our kids at a very young age, you are not in charge. Okay. And if you got chaos in your house, it's because somewhere along the way, the kids thought they were in charge. Now listen, until you start paying rent, you have no voice in where we go eat. Until you buy them, if I, you understand what I'm saying? If I want to eat, my kids hate, Jap well, my son, my son hates Japanese. I love Japanese. I, go to, I could eat Japanese every other week. I mean, every other day, I could eat Japanese. I love sushi. I love, I love hibachi chicken. I love hibachi steak. I like teriyaki. Come on, somebody. And, and when I get that combination, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Ha, hey, I feel glow. And when I get that combination, I don't even want the soup. I just want two salads with the ginger dressing. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. And, and every time I want to go eat Japanese, my son goes, oh, you eat Japanese. I'm like, are you buying? If you buying, I'll give you a say-so. But until you start buying, you can shut up and eat your ramen noodles. <laughs> but as for me and my house and my wallet, we going to the Japanese joint. <laughs> and somewhere along the way, we, we, we stop giving commands. Listen, I'm not talking about leading with demands. I'm talking about leading by commands. And the command of Jesus to the 70 that he appointed was to go. Listen, this was not negotiable. He, he wasn't saying, hey, listen, if you feel like it, would you like to go? He said, you're my disciple? If you're my disciple, then you are a follower of me. And if you're following me, then I'm in charge. And I'm not going to lead by demand, but I am going to lead by command. And this is what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to go because I'm sending you. This is the backdrop for this message today. We're in this series called Let's Go. Let's go! And last Sunday we talked about this coming out and going in thing. 1 Samuel 18, 12 through 16 says, Now Saul, afraid of David, because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. Verse 13, Therefore Saul removed him from his presence and made him his captain over a thousand. And watch this, he went out and came in before the people. And we talked about it last week, all throughout the text. New Testament and Old Testament, we see this concept of going out and coming in. Last week we talked about coming in. Today we're going to talk about going out. Therefore, when Saul saw that, he behaved badly, uh, wisely because he was afraid of him. But all of Israel loved and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. This concept of coming out and going in is a picture of modern-day warfare. This is a warfare phrase coming out and going in and modern warfare today is coming in to worship which is what we did and praise God for his presence that's in this place and coming in for worship but listen he doesn't come in because you showed up he comes in because worshipers do he doesn't come in because you sing he comes in because worship is happening through song and this going out concept is that of witnessing the balance of worship and witness Worship and witness. This is modern day warfare. Watch this. The Old Testament, these are the things that happen literally. But for us in, the, in this New Testament era, this is now where we deal with this spiritually. These literally happen. These things happen in the, in the Old Testament to give us a spiritual principle in the New Testament of what you and I are to deal with. Modern day warfare for you and for me is the balance of us going out and coming in. It's the balance. 
And when we have this balance, there's a consistency that is in our lives. Because people who are just go-outers, they, they never come in. We, we see a lot of this in missionaries, evangelists, people who are always preaching and teaching and going and doing this stuff. They have this, they have this level of fatigue and frustration about them. They're, they're always tired or they're always frustrated and mad. They're frustrated with the church or they're frustrated with what the church is not doing and they're frustrated with, with, with how ineffective things are and they're constantly frustrated and they're battling fatigue. They're always tired. I have, I have never met a missionary who looked fully engaged with their energy because they're so busy going. And the reason why they're fatigued is not because they're going, it's because they don't stop long enough to come in. Because how can you feed people when you're starving yourself? I call these kind of people the go-outers only kind of people, uh, joyless Jesus followers. They, they love Jesus, they serve Jesus, they're called of Jesus. But there's no joy in their life. And then you've got the come-inners. These are the people who, who, it's all about being in the glory. It's all about, like, like just a moment ago, it, their whole life is about the manifestation of the glory of God inside the church. And, and they live in this perpetual following the glory cloud. But I, I will submit to you that following the glory cloud as, as we see it in, in Moses' day, they had to set up their church, but they were following him outside of it the whole time. And these come-inners, they struggle with self. It's all about, they, my, my wife says it this way, it's all about them getting their gift on. I'm, gonna, I'm coming here today and I'm going to get my gift on. I got the gift of this and watch me unleash it. They want to get their gift on. They, it, they struggle with self. And, and I call it pseudo-spirituality. They're super spiritual. And they live on this, how are you doing? Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. You're blessed and highly favored? Yes, I am. I'm blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed in my... And you never have a problem. You can't live there. And every person that shows me that is, is a terrifying person to me because somewhere it's superficial. And if you're the kind of person who never has a struggle, then you're already dead and you don't know it. Because it's only people in heaven that have no issues. But I felt the resistance a little bit last Sunday when I talked about the come, come inners only. And I want to drill this in a little more on why we should go out. What, what if a person dis determines, I'm a worshiper, I'm a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord, I, I'm, this, I'm, this, I'm this intercessor. And I live in the presence of God like the high priest. Listen, listen. You've got to balance it with, with scriptural doctrine. You may be the high priest, but you were only allowed to go in one time a year. Come into his presence one time a year. What were you doing every other time? Even the high priest did not live in the holy place 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. But, but it doesn't sound bad to, to say I'm going to be a come-inner and I'm coming into the presence of the Lord and I'm going to live in the presence of the Lord and I'm going to dwell. It doesn't sound bad. That's, that's a very noble thing to say. But just because it doesn't sound bad doesn't mean it isn't. And you can do a good thing and not do a God thing. And what God is asking you to do is live in balance. You see, the balanced life is one that balances the ability to come in in worship and to go out in witness. It's the difference, look at this image of this pond versus this river. It's the difference between a pond and a river. Nobody wants to get baptized in the image above. Nobody is going to drink. Uh, my wife, she likes, she's a survivalist and, and you know, we, we, we we're going to prepare, we got... We got food for five years in these containers, and you know what I'm talking about. And, and um, she was watching some kind of, y'all know what I'm talking about? This, what do you call those doomsday people or whatever? Listen, I'm out of here. I'm out of, you can stay if you want to. 
I'm out of here. <laughs> I mean, I'm gone. Uh, you know, and I got guns, and I'm prepared to shoot if I need to to protect my family. But, you know, to be absent from this body, to be present with the Lord, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. And, but I got enough food to feed, you know, us. And so if doomsday ever comes, you can come get the stuff from me, but you're going to be in a fight. Just going to let you know. Between me, Eric, and Danny, and, and, and Troy, we're good. We're all going to bunk up at Eric's house. And uh, I'll bring the food. Y'all bring, bring everything else. Uh, uh, fat boy got to eat, you know what I'm saying? Y'all didn't have to laugh that hard. What's wrong with y'all? But one represents a reservoir. There's a lot of water going into the pond. But the reason why it's so stagnant and nasty is because nothing ever comes out of it. So it sits, not moving. And because it's not moving, it becomes full of algae and nasty. And no one wants to partake of it. You didn't hear what I said. When you're not moving, you spiritual reservoir, you become nasty and nobody wants to partake of church because you are stagnant and stinky and on the surface of your life it's nasty and nobody wants to try to take a dip. In contrast to that, to that, to that body of water that both comes in and goes out, look at how pure it is. Look at how flowing it is. Look, look at how significant it is. Because watch this, the, and, and, and this is one of the things about bottled water today that they're worried about, is because there's so much purification that takes place in the bottles of water, water that we're not getting the minerals that come by the flowing between rocks. You see, the potency of water that is uh, drinkable is when it flows through the rock that gets the necessary ingredients in it that can quench our thirst. I'm preaching now. The question is, are you a reservoir or are you a river? For out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. But if you never break the dam in your life and allow it to flow, you just become stagnant and nasty and nobody wants your kind of Jesus. Coming out and going in. Interesting. David is the backdrop for last Sunday about coming in. He was a warrior and a worshiper. What if David could show us the picture of what it means to not go out, a worshiper only? What if this same God that his son Solomon said, man, God, if I'm going to take the position of the throne that you gave my dad, I'm going to have to learn the, the art of going out and coming in like he did. What if this same guy that was a model for Solomon, the wisest man in history, could show us what it looks like when you don't go out? Well, he did in 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11 says, It happened in the spring of the year. At a time, yeah, it's on your screen too. At the time when the kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel, and they destroyed the people of Amnon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at the place of worship, Jerusalem, the city of God the church, the sanctuary of the dwelling place of God. In the season where he was supposed to go out, he stayed in. When he was supposed to go out, he stayed in. Verse number two, I love this. And because he stayed in, then it happened. One evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house and from the roof he saw a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful to behold. He decided he was not going to go out. He was going to stay in. And when he stayed in, he fell. 
Because he did not go out in the season where he was supposed to go out, this is what kings, royalty does. If you're going to be a man or a woman of royalty, there are seasons when you must go out. But he decided he's fought enough, he's witnessed enough, he's won enough, he's done enough warfare, he's handled all of this, that he decided he deserved some me time, so he was going to take a break and chill at the house. He was going to just watch on live stream and just take a break because he deserves it. He's got wounds and he's got stuff that's going on in his life and because he's got stuff going on in his life, he decided that he was gonna need a break because he had been burned out by all this other stuff. So he decided he was gonna stay and take a chill in a season where he was supposed to go out. He decided to not come in because you can't come in if you don't go out first. And you can't go out if you're not in. He decided he was going to stay in, and because he stayed in, watch this, he did not want to go out to fight a battle. So he stayed in and lost an internal one. He stayed in and lost an internal one. You see, whether he was going out or coming in, he was going to be in a fight. The question is, do you want to fight with people for victory for a nation, or do you want to run the risk of fighting your own inward battle and fall in the darkness of your own room? Going out. When I think about going out, I'm in Luke 14 now. I can't help but think of this picture that Jesus gave, this parable that he gave. And I'm almost done. He had this parable in Luke chapter number 14. And now when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, they were talking about all the stuff going on in the kingdom. They were sitting around eating. He said, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said, watch this, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many. And he sent his servants to supper at supper time. Watch this. At supper time, he sent his servants. When it was time to eat, it was the time for his service to go out. To say to those who were invited, come in, for all things are now ready. Verse 18, but they all with one accord began to make excuses. <laughs> all the people who were in relationship with the banquet master who knew him, who was in fellowship with him, who was invited personally by him, all of those people to the banquet that were invited started making excuses on why they shouldn't come. Watch this. The first one said, I bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I, well, I ask you to have me excused. Verse 19, and another said, I bought five oxen, yoke of oxen, and I am going to test them. I ask you to have me excused excused and still another said I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come so that servant came and reported these things to his master and then the master of the house began being angry said to his servant say it with me go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in or come in the poor the maimed and the lame and the blind and the servant said master it is done as you have commanded led by command not demand and still there is room 23 then the master said to the servant go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled for I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper Wow. He, he, he's painting a picture of us of a, of a great banquet. And, and you got to understand, these banquets were incredible, and they were filled with all types of exotic foods. Listen, the, the normal dietary needs of that day were very common and bland. Can't wait to go to Israel in a couple months. By the way, I've already got our next trip in October of 2018 prepared. And, and I can't wait to go because in context... Their, their normal dietary eating was very bland. 
It's very bland. It, it wasn't like today where you can just go and pretty much eat wherever you want to eat. I talked about Japanese earlier. You didn't just go get Japanese food in, in, in these days. It was whatever they had, and most of the stuff was very bread-based, and, and there wasn't a lot of flavor that went with it. But when banquets came, Man, they would bring out all types of exotic food, exotic foods, and it would be an incredible thing for them to partake of, and it was unbelievable the kind of exposure that they had to all of these different things. It was a feast, like nothing they normally had access to, and no one by nature would turn down an invitation to these banquets, which, by the way, were held in the evenings. So you're going to go check a piece of ground at night? You're going to go work your oxen at night? What kind of excuse is that? These banquets were held in the evening. It's dark time, and they didn't have headlights, flashlights, and, 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 and these vehicles to be able to throw the lights on. That wasn't a part. But going out, watch this. Most people, when they're in a surface relationship, it's easy for them to make excuses. Buckle your seatbelt. It's easy to make excuses. The first one said, you know, th did a certain man have a great supper and, and invited, invited many. I'm in, I'm in verse number 16 now. They invited many to this celebration supper. This is a picture of the church. Inviting them to come in today in the New Testament after Acts. This is a picture of Sunday morning church, stereotypically in, in, in our culture, maybe on Saturday or whatever. But this is where you make an invitation to church. And you sent out this great supper, this great baker, this feast with all types of exotic food and festivities. And compelled them to come in and the time is now, here's that word again, Verse 17, the time is now, and, and, and they're ready. And maybe you don't know this. Maybe you're unaware because you're used to just doing church, not being it. Church is a place to feast. It's a place for the bread of heaven to be released, specifically as it relates to the word of God. It's a feast. It's a feast. And if you can't find a house of worship where there's food, I submit to you, that's not a banquet from heaven. This is why I can't preach you opinions. This is why I can't come up here and tell you how great I am and that you need to do my, because I'm not good enough, smart enough, or, 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 good, or, or able at all. The only thing I have of any substance is I'm a bread baker. And bless God, as powerful as the Holy Spirit is, and as he has moved today in some churches, they, have, they would have said, bless God, the Holy Ghost moves so good that the preacher didn't even get to preach. I'm not here to preach. I'm here to give you food to eat and have substance for the rest of your week. And church is a place to feast. And if there's not food, if there's no word in that church, that's not much of a church. That's not a banquet from heaven. Not only is it a feast, but number two, just in case you didn't know, church is a celebration. It's a party. It's on and popping. Don't make me drop it like it's hot. Because I won't be able to get it back up again. You understand? Know but it is a celebration. It's a party. He's been good to me. His mercies were new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. And I have entered his gates with thanksgiving. And I've come into his course with prayer. I can't go to a dead church. And I can't stand beside a dead worshiper. Somebody who is unthankful and ungrateful. He's been better to me than I could be to myself. Don't you stand up here and not have a smile on your face. For the joy of the Lord is my strength. He's been good to me. And these things that I'm going through is because I'm going to something that my eye has not seen. And my ear has not heard. And it's never even entered into my heart. And bless God, I'm here woo, to celebrate. 
You understand what I'm saying? It's a party. I think I pulled my hip. Not only is it a feast, not only is it a celebration, but church is a place of fellowship. It's a place for brethren to dwell together in unity. For where the spirit of unity is, miracle signs and wonders are released. At some point, I'm going to preach Acts chapter 2, verse 42, all the way through the rest of the where there was no need that was among them because they dwelled in such unity. How in the world can we get this church, those in this room and those watching around the world and those watching the YouTube and the, and the pod, listen to the podcast later, how do we get us operating in a spirit of unity? So much so that every need in this house and every need represented by way of live stream, our church family on the internet, how in the world can we get it to a place where there are no needs that are among us because the needs are being met it's when we're in fellowship oh I hear some of you well I got some needs yeah but I can't throw blessed money that was ties at your cursed bank account because you refuse to and expect the blessing to overwhelm the curse that wasn't in my notes but that was free How do you expect for 10% of someone else's stewardship to God to overwhelm the curse on your life because you refuse to be obedient to the things the Lord command? He leads by commands. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Just sit there and take it. I'm about to move on. It's a place for fellowship. You're going to go out to eat at lunch today? And you know your church family is going to witch witch? Yet you feel lonely? Come on. You're fighting these battles. I feel like I'm fighting these battles by myself. I can't get connected to church. I'm inviting you to lunch today. It's called, watch this, the Connect Lunch. So that you don't have to live alone and do this thing by yourself. Not only is it a feast or a celebration or a party or a fellowship, but watch this. Church is a place to be full. It's a place that Jesus commands to be filled. Look beside you. How many empty seats do you have? Look down your row. How many empty seats do you have? Do you have enough relationships to fill this room? Then those people that are not in this room... Listen, when you see them again, just tell them to go to hell. Oh, we got tied in this Holy Ghost field church. Next time you see them and you know they're going to hell, just tell them to go to hell. Because that's what you're saying. You may not be saying it, but you're saying it. Next time, just look at them and go, look, man, I like you, you know, but you might as well go to hell. Because I'm not going to let you. I'm, oh, it got tight. I'm, and the problem is you're going to stand before God with blood on you. His place, his church is a place to be filled. Oh, there you are, Pastor. You, you, you're preaching church growth. No, I'm preaching kingdom growth. That is a responsibility of every person in this room. If you do not live on an island by yourself, work on an island by yourself, then those people that are around you are part of the garden that God has asked you to cultivate. Well, I'm just an introvert. So what? I'm an introvert. There are lots of introverts. But he didn't say, go into all the world and make disciples as long as you're not an introvert. He told Paul, listen, you stand before them and I'll put the words in your mouth to say. We, but we make excuses. Let, let me jump to them. Okay? Watch this, full. Well, by full, I mean two things. Full of the Spirit and people. I do not want to go to a church. I do not want to lead a church. I do not want to preach in a congregation. I do not want to lead a congregation 
that does not desire the fullness of the Spirit of God, both in fruit and in gifts. I don't want a gifts of the Spirit church to have no fruit because they will shine, die, eat a bowl, speak in tongues, lay hands on people and prophesy and do all those things, but then go to witch, witch and cut the waitress out because they put onions on the sandwich. And I don't want to have a fruit-only church where there's no gifts and manifestation. I want the power of discipline and disciple living with a balance of manifestation. And praise God for your love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Praise God for all of that. But none of that helps me get out of this hospital bed, lay hands on me because God gave you the gift of healing, get me up out of this, and now you have validated all the fruit that is in your life because of the gift. And I want my gift to not be disqualified by my lack of fruit. I'm preaching good in this Holy Ghost filled church. This is what a church is. But I want you to see the excuses. And this one's going to sting a little. There were three excuses that were made. Excuse number one, watch this. But they all, with one accord, began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must go see it. I ask you to have me excused. Listen, I call it a possession excuse. You don't understand. I got to go make sure everything's okay in my mountain house. But you don't understand. God blessed me with this beach house. So I can't come to church. I can't come to celebrate, to feast, to fellowship, and to feel. Because God's blessed me with such a blessing that I need to go make sure that my mountain house, my beach house, or the house I'm currently in, this is the only chance that I get to cut the grass. I'm preaching good now. Yeah, I don't feel like it, man. I was up all night watching the game on my 79,000-inch television. And so now I'm too tired to come in. Please tell God to excuse me because of this blessing of a 75-inch TV that he let me have so that I can afford $200 a, a, a month uh, um, uh, cable so that I can watch the Mayweather and McGregor fight. But I can't come to the house of God. Now, please tell Jesus to excuse me because I'm too busy with all my possessions. You don't understand, Pastor. I've got season tickets for the Panthers, and the game starts at 1 o'clock. God forbid you don't get there when the national anthem is played. Well, you know what I'm saying? He's favored me to the point to where I've got to have, look at all these possessions I need to manage. So please excuse me because I'm not going to be able to feast, to celebrate, to fellowship, or to fill this banquet celebration. I'm preaching good in this quiet church. The second excuse, look at it. I call it the professional excuse. It's a professional excuse. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. I ask you to excuse me, to have me excused. This is the professional excuse. I'm too busy working that I don't have time to go into his banquet house and feast, celebrate, fellowship, and feel. I'm too busy. Man, God's blessed me with this job. He's blessed me with this business. He's blessed me with this stuff. And you don't understand, I've got too much work on my plate. They're emailing me and they're calling me and they're texting me and they're writing me and, and all of it. i got to go do these proposals and i got to go to do this bid and i got to go to this. And God's opening up all these doors and all these corporate meetings and all, these, and, and all this. And i got all this stuff going on. Look how professional I am. Tell God I'm too busy because I'm too professional. Hear me. And I resisted saying this, but the Holy Spirit quickened me Friday. When you can't proskuneo two hours a week, your job is too reliant upon you. If you can't 
Give God, not church. See, that's the problem. Most of us come to church. I don't want you to come to church. I want you to come to the throne of grace, whereby with mercy we get to cry, Abba, Father. That should be the cry of every Sunday morning at 10 a.m., Abba, Father. Not my preference of music style, and so I'll wait 20 minutes before I get here. Coming to worship, present myself before the throne of grace, crying Abba. I'm preaching hard this morning because I want change. I want change for you because I want favor on your life. And I don't want you to live a life full of excuses. Too professional. (laughs) Here's what the Holy Spirit said. If you're too busy because of, of your business savvy, Are you too fatigued because of how hard you work? You have replaced coming in to worship Him. And you've decided that you're going to make your own success idolatry. Your success has become your idol that you worship. And here's what I found. Most people are not success driven at their root. Most people are, have this inward desire to prove somebody wrong for why they're driven. Here's what the Holy, here's what the Holy Spirit said. What, watch this. And these are my, all these notes are on you version, the Bible app. I post them every week. Here's what he said. By you clocking out to come in to worship me, you allow me to clock in while you go out to your meetings. In other words, what if you made room for God to work in your seat? I feel the Holy Ghost. Listen, Holy Spirit does not come to condemn, He comes to convict. And if you feel resistance, you need to ask Holy Spirit to help you with where he's dealing with you on a personal level. (laughs) Point number three. Let me make this a little more jovial. Point number three. So I found this interesting. Number one, I have this property. Please have me excused. Number two, I have this business. I have these oxen, this farm that I'm running. Please have me excused. Watch number three. I call it another person excuse. Number three. I have a wife. I can't come. (laughs) For every man who's had to tell their boys, my wife won't let me come. You can appreciate that verse right there. Listen. I I I got possessions. Please have me excused. Listen. Check this out. I got this job. I'm really busy. Please have me excused. He comes to the door. Hey, man. Hey, you coming to the party? It's going to be on and popping, man. It's Monday night football, chicken wings. I'm married. I can't come. The boss lady won't let me out. And all God's men said, you've been there. I want you to hear me. Coming in must be the most important act of your week. I, I, I can't come in because I got to spend time with my lady. What better place to create intimacy than worshiping the God who created your gift for you? For all my dating people, or want to date people, if you find a man who can't worship you've only found half a man because a balanced man is a warrior and a worshiper oh let me oh, let me hallelujah I felt that if you find a man who can't work but can worship you've only found half a man 
Oh, I'm preaching good today. I may listen to this podcast myself. If he's too good for worship, he's too good for you. I, I got this personal... Listen, any person that tries to keep you from the presence of the one who called you, created you, formed you, that's not the right one. You see the excuses? Listen. And, and I hear you talking, okay, because... Like, I got people today. This is Labor Day weekend, and I know there's times we're on vacation, so I want you to hear me with, with balance. But let me, I want to remind you today why we have live stream. Why we do podcasts and why we do YouTube and, and why we have it on the Internet and, and why we do these things. It's for those church family members that literally can't get here. So that they can feed. And so they're, they're at the banquet. But it's like being at the, blank, the banquet with a gl- wall of glass. Uh, it's not the reason. We have live stream so that you can decide whether or not you're too tired to come. Or it's too far to drive. The difference is worth the distance. It's the difference. It's the difference between eating a feast and a frozen dinner. Hallelujah. How many of you eat frozen dinners? How many of you have ever eaten frozen dinners? How many of you like frozen dinners? How many of you have ever been invited to someone's house and they fed you a frozen dinner? I'm praying for all of y'all that's got your hand lifted. Watch this. This frozen dinner will feed you, but it doesn't have flavor. It has nutrients, but it does not have the taste of a banquet. You may be getting fed, but you're missing the feast and the flavor and the fellowship that comes along with a, with, a, with, a, with a banquet. It's the same thing of watching here versus experiencing here. The worship sounds a whole lot better in here than it does on the live stream. The preaching comes across a whole lot better in here than it does on the live stream. Got hate mail last week. Because in here, it makes more sense. Because it, oh, can I just mess with it for a minute? Because if you, see, see, oh God, have mercy. Can I say the way I want to say it? In, in this hypersensitive, everybody's looking to be offended season, let, let me just say this, okay? I'm going to say this, and, and y'all going to have to help everybody else who doesn't understand. I do not have two white kids and one black kid. I have two sons and one daughter. Do you hear what I'm saying? So when I talk about my sons, I'm talking about who they are. Not the color or or the race or the ethnicity that they have. So when I make fun of my son, Noah, okay, okay, you know, when I'm making fun, I'm making fun of Noah, not the white boy. Y'all ain't talking back to me. And when I'm talking about my daughter, I'm I'm talking about my daughter. And I would never bring out their insecurities publicly. I'm preaching good now. And when I'm talking about Chisholm, oh God, I'm not talking about a black kid. I'm talking about my son that lives with me 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That I, you understand that I love and I've taken in as my own and I have grafted him into my family. And when I look at my son Chisholm, I look at six foot ten, I look at a whole lot of food eaten. 
and a whole, a whole lot of loud voice making. But I'm not talking about a black kid. I'm talking about mine. You understand what I'm saying this morning? You, you understand? But, but, but in, in here, you get it. Because you see the way I live my life with my family. I don't, I don't have two white kids and a black kid to live with me. I have two sons and a daughter. So when I post things like, he needs lotion, it's not because he's, he needs cocoa butter. Do you understand? You understand what I'm saying? It, it's because I bought, my wife bought him a bottle to keep in his room. We bought another bottle to keep in the hallway upstairs. And we bought another bottle to put in the kitchen on the counter on the way out. And every stinking morning on the way to school, oh, anybody got any lotion? Yeah, you got three bottles that you pass every single one. <laughs> you understand? So, so when you see hashtag he needs lotion, that is not an indictment against the black kid in my house. That's me teasing my son who lives with me. But you don't get that if you're not into flavor. You, you're, hallelujah, I'm going to make a t-shirt. Get into flavor. Jason said he's going to make me a shirt. He calls this thing called being butt hurt. Anybody know what butt hurt is? Being butt hurt. Anybody know? Why am I talking about this? He, he's gonna, he said he's going to make me a shirt on a scale of zero to butt, how hurt are you? <laughs> I may buy it. I don't, know, I don't know. We'll see. What's this? When this is all you can get, this is what you're willing to eat. And there are people by the thousands every month that this is all they get to eat. They would rather have frozen dinner bread from Judah Church than starve. But this can't be, when you're this close, the excuse we live in. Now, let me hurry. Let me hurry. Watch this. Uh, Luke chapter 14, 22 says, And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded. And still there's room. Now go out into the highways and hedges and compel them. Let me, let me, let me, let me land here. Compel them. Here's what that word means. I need a volunteer. Come on. Come here, Miles. I wanted to call you so bad. <laughs> I wanted to call you so bad. <laughs> no, no. Just stand right here. Put your arm behind your back. Put your, oh, you've done that before, okay. I just, all right. Assume the position. <laughs> that word compel does not mean invite. It means to constrain by force. Almost the bending and twisting of an arm. Anybody ever been here? And force them, constrain them to come in that my house may be filled. When is the last time? Let me tell you when, when compel really is personified in the churches. Let me tell you when compel happens. Mother's Day. Easter. And Christmas. I call them CEO Christians. Christmas, Easter, and other occasions. But your job, your job is to constrain them, to compel them. He has no choice. I'm going to put him where I want to put him. Do you, do you understand what I'm? Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? I want you to see something the Holy Spirit showed me. Jesus is talking to his servants. Notice what he said. Go. And compel them. In other words, get your feet out from under my table and go do something. We are not eating until this house is full. Get your feet out from under my table waiting on me to feed you 
until there's enough people in this room that is worthy of the feast that I have prepared, Jesus said. Now, I want to give you the compel list. Let me hurry. We find it in Luke 14, 21 and 23. The servant said, reported these things to his master, go out into the streets and the lanes and, and compel them. Bring them in or come in, the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. 23 says, then the master said to go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. Here's your target list. You want to know who to witness to? Here's your target list according to Jesus. Number one, the poor. When you bump into someone who has a need, it is an indicator to you they need to come in. When someone in the cubicle beside you talks about a need, Jesus is saying what they need is for you to compel them to come in. When you bump into someone at a restaurant or walking down the street or standing on a street corner underneath a stoplight with a sign that says, I need, what they're saying is, compel me to come in. Not only the poor, but the main. When you bump into someone who is broken, that broken person is God letting you know you need to compel them to come in. When they're sitting there and they come in and their eyes are swollen and they're broken hearted and they get up every five minutes to go running into the bathroom from their office space, God is showing you a maimed person and the reason why he has shown you this maimed individual is because he is telling you, I am asking you to get your feet out from under the table and compel this broken person to come in. Stop saying I'm going to pray for you and start telling them you got to come in with me. Maimed, lame. Every person that you bump into that you see is stuck. Jesus is saying, I brought you to them to, com to constrain them to come in. What I love about Troy, what I love about Troy is almost every Sunday he drives to Charlotte Rescue Mission to go pick up lame men in their addictions. And he does not bring them to self-help. He brings them into a place where God meets with his people. A young man last Sunday came up to me with tears in his eyes and an offering in his hand and said, Pastor, I need to give this and sow this. Tears in his eyes. He said, I so needed to be in the presence of the Lord today. Thank you for what you're doing here. And I'm like, no. Thank you for being willing to come in. You didn't come in to see Glenn. You did not have an encounter with Glenn. You had an encounter with God. And if you want to present an offering to the Lord, I will receive it on behalf of the God that did something in your life. He's lame. How many stuck people do you bump into every single week? Stuck in a broken marriage. They're, they're stuck in their addiction. They're stuck in their bondage. They're stuck in a dead-end job. They're, they're stuck in whatever. Whatever the, you hear them say, I'm stuck, it's an indicator to you. Jesus is saying, I brought you, I sent you servants to restrain them to come in. Lame, blind. When you hear men and women talking about their lack of vision for their life, they're so focused on what... <laughs> I, I call it their living life looking in the rearview mirror. They have no idea where they're going because they're so focused on seeing where they've been. You will wreck where you're going always looking at your past. He said if you find people that have no vision for their life, tell them to come to the God. Come in. It's your indicator servant. I got you out from under the table so that you can tell them to come into my presence and I'll give them a vision for I know the plans I have for them. Put them in front of me and I'll tell them what they do next. Highways. When you bump into random people in the highway, you just out and you bump into people. Could it be that you bumped into them to compel them to come in? They need a feast. 
or they need a party, or they need fellowship, so they can see what full people look like. There's too many illustrations of empty Christians. What would happen if they come in here and see people that are full of the Spirit? Not only the highways, but lastly, the hedges. The hedges. <laughs> this is funny. I'm like, hedges. Here's what the Holy Spirit said. If you see a man working in his yard, you need to compel him to come. Well, that's not spiritual at all. No. Nope. Find somebody. Listen, we got plenty of yard work to do around here. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And if you see somebody out there trimming their hedges, compel them. To, God is saying, I've given you an illustration. I've got your feet out from under my table. So you found that person that is compelling them. You constrain, constrain them to come in. I hear you. I hear you this morning. I hear you. Well, Pastor, I just, I'm just waiting on the Lord to, to lead me. Just, I just wait on the Lord to lead me. Let me help all of you in this room. You ready? Satan is not going to ask you to witness to somebody. So if he gives you an indicator in your mind and your spirit, it says, you really ought to witness to this person. That's not the devil. I just need to pray about it. No, why? Well, it might just be me. Let me, let me help all of you in this room. I, I've been around all of you in some way. There are none of you that spiritual. I haven't found one person in this room so spiritual that they would think about being a witness without the Holy Spirit. So if it's not you and it's not the devil, y'all ain't gonna talk to me, okay. Why are we waiting to feel led? That's why he spoke to you. You, you ain't spiritual enough to go, I need to witness to this person. You're thinking about the game, good or bad. But yet it pops up in your mind, in your spirit, in your heart. Man, I need to witness to this person. That's the Spirit of God talking to you. Be obedient. Now go. Let's say what, what, witnessing, witnessing. Listen, witnessing is natural unless you stop it. I'm about to help all of you this morning. Witnessing is a natural occurrence unless you stop it. It's only when you get your flesh or your insecurity in the way that it becomes unnatural. Witnessing is a natural occurrence unless you get in the middle of it and stop it. Well, well, well what do you mean? Witnessing is simply talking about the person you're in love with. And when you're in love with Jesus, When you get squeezed, that love comes out. Listen, listen. Do you know how many people over the course of the last five years we've been at Judah Church have asked me if I love my wife? Nobody asked me that question. As a matter of fact, the majority of you get grossed out by how much publicly I love my wife. Listen, I love her. I, I'm, you understand? I, I love everything about her. I like the way she walks. I like the way she moves. I mean, I was backing out the driveway two days ago, and I'm just singing a love song to her while she's standing in the garage. Just woke up, still got the crusties, you know, hadn't had a coffee yet, looked like the devil coming out. You know? But... There's something sassy about a devil. You understand what I'm saying? Every time, you know what I'm saying? You know understand what I'm saying? It's, listen, I'm, I'm singing a love song to her. I won't sing the song I sung because that wouldn't be appropriate. But you know, that's what's up. It's natural. When you're in love, the moment it starts to happen, it just flows. So, I, I bought everybody a gift this morning. Guys, if you'll help me, 
I bought everybody a gift this morning. Help, help me, help me, Joshua. Eric, will you hop up and help me too? I, I want this go as quickly as possible. Yeah, yeah, y'all help me, help me. I bought everybody a gift this morning. I bought everybody in this room a gift. 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 You got it? You got it? We got everybody? We got everybody? If you got it, stand with me. If you got my gift this morning, I want you to stand with me. If you got my gift, stand with me this morning. That way I know who's, who's, who's with me. got it? You got it? If you got to stand with me. If you got to stand with me, be physically able. You have it? You have it? You have it? We got everybody? Listen, uh, for those of you, for those of you that have ever gone fishing or anything, this thing is called a sinker. It kind of looks like rabbit pellets, but uh, this is <laughs> it's a sinker. And, and, and I took the time to give you a sinker that has a little eye hook in it so that, um, you know, like for me, I have this on my keychain. I uh, put it on there this morning. And, and what this, thank you, sir. And, and what this is, is this is a sinker for fishing, right? And I hear what you're saying. Oh, man, Pastor, you're talking about being a fisherman and going and being fishing and going fishing and being, yeah, no. No. I want everybody, everybody, everybody hold it. Everybody hold it. I want you to hold the gray part. I want you to hold the gray part. Hey, you got it? You got the gray part? You know what that gray part is? It's lead. And right now, you're feeling lead. Some of you slow, but you wasn't waiting on. So, so I want you to keep this in your pocket, put it on your keychain, hang it from your mirror, and every time Holy Spirit pops up with a witness, I just want you to reach up and just feel led. I don't know if I feel led. Now you feel led. Every one of you in this room, you have now felt led. So, listen. There are people dying and going to hell. And I don't know if you recognize this or not, but we are as close to his return as we have ever been. And the more wars and rumor of wars, I looked at uh, this morning and, and North Korea has, has now just bla uh, uh, um, broadcast and boasted that they now have a hydrogen bomb that is missile ready. And all this rumor and all this posturing between people and all this political non st stuff that is going on. Listen, listen, it's all crescendoing to one main event. And soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. And you know what I say? I say, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And today, I believe God has summoned Judah Church to feel led to go out into the highways and the hedges to go out to the maimed to the lame to the blind to the broken to the hurting to the wounded to the to the scarred to those listen if there are people that have are full of excuses that are in our lives listen that's their decision to make but it's my decision that i got to get out from under the table get my feet out from under the table and go by the leading of the spirit that is now leading me to go out to be a witness for him so that his house may be full. Because I believe that there are people who need to have the same testimony that you and I have. Do you know what that testimony is? Do you know what that testimony is? Come here, Vince. Do you know what that testimony is? I was buried beneath 
my sin. Can you throw those words up there for me? All my failures, I tried to hide. But when he called my name, I ran out of the grave, out of the darkness, into his glorious day. When he called my name, I ran out. How many of you this morning, as a testimony, would say, I have been saved, I have been redeemed, I have been renewed, I have been restored, I have been justified, I have been sanctified, I have been set apart for holy use today. Come on, with a heart of gratitude all over this room, I just want us to worship Him, that He found us, and He called us, and He has restored us, and He has renewed all over this room. Father, we love you today. We praise you for what you have done in our lives. And we praise you, Lord, for what you are about to do in our lives through our witness. We say today, God, by the leading of the Spirit, we feel led today to go to compel those to come into your house. That they may feast at the king's table. That they may party in the banquet of the holy place. That they may fellowship with brothers and sisters of like faith with the spirit of unity. That they may walk in the fullness of of what it means to be a child filled with your spirit today. I ask it, and I praise you for it. In Jesus' name, sing that verse for me. Sing that verse for me. I was buried.